So good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you guys are dialing in from. I'm Cleo Hardman, your president and point of contact for ICRES. Um, I hope all of you and your families are safe and healthy despite the current situation. I know this isn't the ideal format, but thank you all for joining us anyway. I'm delighted to be co-hosting this webinar today with Kelvin Yap, our incoming conference chair, whom I'm sure all of you know well. Together, we're honoured to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Jonathan Dunn. Mr. Dunn was one of our earliest faculty members at IPRESS, teaching and leading workshops for our conferences during his microsurgery fellowship at Charing Cross Hospital back in 2018. I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate him again on his new appointment as consultant within the Trust and to thank him for his continued support for the Society. Um, Mr. Dunn completed his medical degree in Bristol, one of the best cities in the world. Um, I'm absolutely not biased in any way and certainly didn't study there. Um, Jonathan continued his uh, training in various hospitals in London, enjoyed teaching and research, having routinely led the journal club sessions for the plastic surgery department at Charing Cross. He has a keen interest in facial surgery and today he's kindly taken time out of his busy schedule to speak to us about one of his favourite topics, skin cancer. Let's welcome Mr Jonathan Dunn. Thank you, Cleo, and thanks for inviting me to speak again at the Society. Slightly different format, sir. Sure, all will run smoothly, very well organised as ever. So, to everyone who's joined, it's two talks really. First, we're going to talk about non-melanoma skin cancer, which is pretty much everything else. And then, for the second talk, it'll be a bit shorter and it's, it's melanoma. So, just to go through, I know you've sent me some of the objectives of learning that the society's put together. So, hopefully we'll cover most of those and illustrate them with some cases. So really skin cancer, a lot of it comes down to the anatomy of the skin <clears throat> and then you can determine the different tumour pathologies and their origins and we'll talk a bit about actually the origins remain quite uncertain despite skin cancer being the commonest malignancy. Etiology, what the spread is and then we'll go on a bit about clinical assessment, how it's managed both surgically and non-surgically and prognosis of non-melanoma skin cancer. So really skin cancer is all about spotting patterns <clears throat> the history gives you a certain amount but examining is really the key and you soon get a feel having seen more and more of what looks normal and what looks abnormal and i think at medical school what the main one you will learn about is actually melanoma and you'll learn about how it looks different to other moles and you can see the bottom left as we look at the screen that's a melanoma but you often get other pigmented things which look maybe worrying maybe not but you soon get a feel for what looks normal or abnormal and the top right is a seborrheic keratosis which is very common and then the other two pictures we look at are, are actually non-melanoma skin cancers and we'll come on to those the bottom right is a, a bcc and the top left is a variant of squamous cell carcinoma which is again there's uncertainty about classification and that's really an underlying theme in in skin cancer that there remain uncertainties despite it being such a common problem <clears throat> so what's the skin anatomy well malignant skin tumors is, as i said it's malignant melanoma and then the rest really and the two that we talk about the most for non-melanoma skin cancer we'll talk about today are squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma malignant melanoma really has gained the most traction in terms of public awareness because of high rates and high death rates particularly among the young who catch it so it's been something that's been fed into the news and Australia was really the first to pick up on this because because of climate change issues, hot weather, Caucasian skin um, being very prone to it. That's the one we know more about. But actually squamous cell carcinomas also have the, t the potential to metastasize spread, cause significant mortality. And basal cell carcinomas are the commonest of any malignancy from any form. And the di difference with them is that they are locally destructive, but any spread is extremely, extremely rare to the degree that you tend to tell patients that it doesn't spread. Um, but it's locally a problem and that's the commonest we see. And you, you commonly see the non-melanoma skin cancers in elderly patients. And this would be a typical patient you see who's elderly, lots of chronic skin changes. And actually, is this a BCC? Is this an SCC? You could probably argue it either way, but the likelihood is it's an SCC, but we'll go on to what the difference is. So the anatomy of the skin, as many of you will know, it's epidermis, which is the top layer. And really that's quite a simple layer. It's waterproofing, if you like. And if you see someone who's sunburnt and peeling, 
it's this layer that's affected. The dermis is the bit underneath, and that really gives you all the important elements of the skin. So it gives you sensory receptors, hair follicles um, for regulation of temperature, sebaceous glands to modify secretions, and that's where a lot of the collagen is. But for skin cancer purposes, what we're talking about is the cells in the top layer, the epidermis, and the principal cell and cell type of skin which causes problems is the keratinocyte. And what you can also call melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer is keratinocyte or non-keratinocyte cancer. And non-melanoma skin cancers are a cancer of the keratinocyte. So that's the principal cell that we're concerned about in non-melanoma skin cancer. Just to mention before we go on to BCCs and SCCs, the other non-melanoma skin cancers are really all about the other cell types that we just saw in the diagram. <clears throat> You've got sebaceous glands and you can get sebaceous carcinoma and that has a predilection for the eyelids and the top picture is an example of that. It's actually very aggressive, tends to occur in elderly patients and you can imagine if you need to excise this with a margin, you're going to leave a considerable defect for reconstruction. So it's very challenging. Merkel cell carcinoma, I've put query sensory organ because it's always been perceived as the Merkel cell as a sensory organ and that's where this tumour comes from. But actually what, you've, what we've found more recently is, is it a problem with the lymphocytes? And that is very much an unknown. So we don't know. And that's a, a theme for also BCCs and SCCs. Has the exact origin been pinpointed? And there is uncertainty and lots of work to be done. But Merkel cell is an aggressive carcinoma, occurs in the elderly, looks like this picture on the, on the bottom right, and often has lymph node spread, widespread metastases, and has a high mortality rate. Last one, hair follicles. There are a number of different types, but it tends to begin with trich, T-R-I-C-H, and has some other, something else, trichelamal, trichefolliculoma is a benign one, but it's just something to be aware of. Different structures have different malignancies associated with them, um, although less common than BCCs and SCCs. So the epidermal layers really give the key to the tumours that arise from them. And the cor stratum corneum at the top, so five layers, corneum at the top, really mainly uh, made of dead cells. So it doesn't have an active component, so it doesn't really produce any tumours. It's really the ones at the bottom of the epidermis that are causing the problems. Melanocytes, usually in the bottom basal layer, can be in the layer above it, uh, the stratum spinosum. Now, BCCs and SCCs also in the bottom layers, and BCCs, unsurprisingly, basal cell from the basale layer. The bit of contention is where it comes from, and it's from keratinocytes, but where do they reside? And it was thought that it was primarily around the hair follicles, and they grow there, not a follicular tumour. But actually, it's thought they're probably in between the follicles now. So actually, despite lots of research, we still don't know the exact area that they come from but it's in the bottom layer and the SCCs are just above and what the squamous cells actually do in, when they're non-malignant is all cells come from the bottom layer and rise up towards the surface and the SCCs develop as the squamous cells pass up towards the top layer of skin and ultimately the apo they apoptose so they die. Um, but that's the layers of the skin, we're talking about the deeper layers of the epidermis so the top layer of skin that are the problem. For any malignancy, it changes from being a pre-malignant condition to a malignant condition when it passes through the basement membrane. So the basement membrane separates the epidermis and the dermis, and that's when a pre-malignant lesion or in situ then becomes malignant. So when it's pre-malignant or in situ, there's no chance of it spreading. It's, it can only stay localized. So we often see melanoma in situ, we can see squamous cell in situ or Bowen's disease, and we'll come on to an example of that. But it becomes invasive when it passes a deep, deep to the basement membrane, and that's when we worry about melanomas specifically, but also SCCs becoming a problem. So what causes it, and what's the geographical spread? Who do we need to look to to work out who's going to have a problem from these conditions? The primary reason is ultraviolet light and particularly UVB as opposed to UVA. This is the better known sun creams and also 
modern ones really all cover for UVA and UVB but it wasn't uncommon in the past to have sun creams that only covered UVA but actually UVB is the problem so that's something that has changed in terms of protection and particularly with more publicity and public health campaigns but UV light and exposure to it is the main problem and in non-melanoma skin cancers it tends to be an accumulation over time so people who typically have moved to hot areas and have pale skin so Fitzpatrick scale describes type 1 to type 6 type 1 skin is very pale white typically people of northern european descent who always burn and never tan when exposed to to um, sunlight and type 6 people who who never burn and is, is black skin so that's uv light it's an accumulation so throughout your life that you develop these changes and ultimately a genetic change leading to a tumor and it's bccs and sccs that have this melanoma seems to be slightly different in that it's short bursts of sunburn that cause the problem so people who've used sunbeds for a period and are young or have had lots of sunburn as a child seem to be the ones who get melanoma as opposed to non-melanoma skin cancer so uv light pale skin and then the third thing that we see quite a bit of is immunosuppression. So immunosuppression is a risk for BCCs and SCCs, but is primarily linked with SCCs. And we're concerned about them because they're higher in volume in the immunosuppressed population. And in addition, they have a higher risk to spread and mortality ultimately. But at Imperial, it's a huge transplant center. So we see lots of patients who are immunosuppressed from that perspective. Other hospitals like Chelsea and Westminster have a huge HIV population and they are also at risk of developing non-melanoma skin cancer. So these are the three big things really that predispose you to developing non-melanoma skin cancer. There are less common ones. Um, people who've had radiotherapy or other radiation exposure are at risk. Um, the newer radiotherapy techniques tend to be much more focused. If you're having radiotherapy for a skin lesion, it's more superficial. So you don't get the huge widespread field changes that people used to have. Then genetics. Ultimately, it is a genetic change that the sunlight or UV light is, is inducing. Um, but there are genetic conditions. One which is specific to BCCs is called Gorlin syndrome. And there's a gene called the PITCH gene, which predisposes people to developing this abnormality. Um, and you see people with multiple BCCs which is mainly a self-limiting problem because once you excise a BCC, it's usually cured. There are other conditions though, which really predispose to aggressive BCCs and SCCs. And the two that you need to know most about are xeroderma pigmentosum. So an issue, an autosomal recessive problem in and a mismatch repair gene issue. And that's what this girl here has. And you can see on the, by the right eyelid, eyelid being pulled down, She's got two or three tumours that look in keeping with SCCs and a keratotic. And the ultimate problem is that these patients typically only survive into their teens or 20s. Um, it's a horrific condition that really you can't have any exposure to UV light because you can't recover the ge genetic um, processing, if you like, when there is a genetic error. And I've certainly only seen one or two cases in my time, but they were working in sub-Saharan Africa. It is as a higher incidence in Afro-Caribbeans and it was a, an eight-year-old boy with an aggressive SCC of the lip. So it's a horrific condition and unfortunately people don't survive very long when they have it. The other thing again when working in Malawi or lots of is people with albinism so they're very predisposed to ocular issues but also aggressive squamous cell carcinomas and it's almost an inevitability that you will get one in your 20s or 30s. Um, so two very aggressive conditions require aggressive management. We see less of in this country, but worldwide is a big problem. The two other things just to consider, HPV infection, you'll learn, is typically associated with cervical cancers, and there is now um, HPV vaccination program. The other thing we see a lot of is head and neck cancer, so particularly oropharyngeal head and neck cancer. It's strongly linked with that. And there's a question mark of whether it's also in skin cancers because HPV causes squamous cell carcinomas of mucosal origin in head and neck cancer. But in skin cancer, it's been postulated that it's also the same. 
but there's no definitive evidence yet. Um, the final thing, unusual things, arsenic ingestion can cause it. And then there's a couple of rare associations such as um, Parkinson's disease, and that's also with melanoma, but not really any proof. So it's very much postulated. So who gets it? Well, BCC, the commonest malignancy, as you can see on the on the right hand side of the page, it's about 1% incidence per year. So one in 100 each year, and it's very much the older population. Much more common in the elderly people of white skin. And if you have one, then the chance of you getting another within three years are 50%. So it's, it's a high risk thing. But the main thing to know is metastasis is rare. So it's really localized problems. If you have one on the trunk, on the limbs, it's an easy problem to deal with. You tend to excise it and we'll come on to the management of that. But if you have one on specialized areas like the eyelid, like the nose, you're really trying to preserve tissue, but get the tumor excised and reconstruct it. So it's on the face really where BCCs cause a problem. For SCCs, incidence at the most is about 0.3% incidence per year. So three in a thousand, maybe slightly less but definitely increased in warmer climates. If you look at US data, if you live in on the Eastern seaboard in the Northern areas where it's cold, you tend to get less. If you look at the Southern states, people with who are type one or two skin, you get a much higher incidence. And again, it's elderly people who are getting it because it's an accumulation of sun exposure over time. And then really the key point, particularly in our population here, <clears throat> is that if you have had a transplant, then you are immunosuppressed and your risk of getting an SCC is 100, 100 times that of the normal population. BCC is slightly less, but it's the SCCs we particularly worry about because obviously they have the risk of metastasizing, spreading elsewhere and, and causing death. So clinical assessment, well, it goes back to basics of doing a history and performing an examination. And the examination obviously is different to, to other specialties and systems and initially dermatology, and skin examinations can seem quite daunting because there's a lot of pattern recognition. It's not quite so systematic as other specialties, but you've still got to go through things in a routine. But really what you want to know when you see a patient, the history is quick because you want to know, they'll tell you about the lesion. Where is it? When did they first notice it? Typically it's a few months history, but it may well have been there a lot longer. And what you really want to know is, is it growing and is it changing? So. They're the ones, before you even looked at it, you'll know, oh yes, it's grown quite quickly over two or three weeks, two or three months. It, it is bleeding a bit, it's a wound. Then there's usually a reason why, it's, why you get such things and it's usually because it's a malignancy. All the other things really are just around etiology. So what are the risk factors for UV light exposure? If we're seeing them in this country, have they lived abroad for any period? Have they had episodes of sunburn or have they used sunbeds? Sunbeds, it's difficult to quantify the risk, but they're still commonly used. You'll still, still see tanning salons and the, the risk of developing a skin cancer, and it's actually more melanoma, but it's similar to smoking about 20 to 40 cigarettes per day for a sustained period. So really high risk and something definitely to ask about in the younger patient. Have they had a previous skin cancer? As we said, if you've had one before, you're quite likely to get another and any suggestion of other problems such as immunosuppression in the past history or any family history going towards any genetic predisposition. So then when you finally see the patient and look at the lesion on the examination, so this picture here, you can see it's a relatively big lesion for a finger. It's about one and a half centimeters. What does it look like? Well, it looks quite likely in terms of, is it aggressive or not? You can just look at that and say, it, it doesn't look quite right. It looks it looks like it's going to be problematic and it's likely to be a malignancy before you've done too much. And you want to know, is it elevated from the skin? Is the board irregular? Is it ulcerated? Well, it is elevated, this one. It's, it's more like a nodule. It has a regular border, but that doesn't tell us too much more. But it's ulcerated as well. So ulcerated meaning there's a wound there, there's a break in the skin. When you've seen something like this, even for BCCs, it's quite good practice to examine the regional lymph nodes. This is an SCC, so the chances are well, it could well metastasize. It's quite big. It's probably been there for a while. Examine the regional lymph nodes, which is the axilla. So feel for any lymphadenopathy there. And then you should always do a full skin check on any new skin patient, because if they have one, they're quite likely to get another. Um, <clears throat> as you can see by just looking at this patient's hand, there's lots of chronic skin changes of, uh, 
it, the skin being dry, variably coloured, not necessarily pigmented, but scaling appearance, patchy discoloration, and that's really accumulated, accumulation of sun exposure. So now on to looking at BCCs in particular. The classical appearance of a BCC is it's pearly. So as you can see here, it's got that sort of sheen to it. It's got rolled edges. It's got small blood vessels, which are called telangiectasia, and it has an ulcer. You could probably argue the very central part of that is a little ulcer, there's a little break in the skin, just where it looks a bit scaly towards the middle. Um, <clears throat> and really, the, that's the classical appearance, but it comes in lots of forms. And the best way to categorize them, is it well circumscribed or is it diffuse? So can you draw a line around it easily or is it not like that? I think actually if you look at the one in the picture you could probably confidently draw a line around two-thirds of it but there are bits where is there a blood vessel is there not so actually this is a bit of a mixed pattern and what you typically find is that probably half are of a mixed pattern so they're quite well circumscribed but there's bits you're unsure of and that really has an implication for surgical management of can you be sure you're going to get it all out and we'll go on to that <clears throat> so here's different types if you look on the left nodular that's well circumscribed. You'd be confident that's what it is. You can draw a line clearly around it. And you're probably going to be quite happy you can remove that with a margin of normal skin. The problem is the location in this patient that it's on the eyelid and that's likely to be a challenging reconstruction. On the right hand side, if you look at the bottom right, that's very flat, that lesion, and it's scaling in appearance and it's a superficial BCC. So it's really just in the top layers of the epidermis in the epidermis, sorry, and the top layer of the dermis. So it's invasive, but it stayed superficial rather than infiltrating deeper layers of the skin because the tumor is locally aggressive. So it can only, it grows up a bit. That's why you've got a lump, but it grows down into the dermis and can go into fat and deeper structures if it's particularly aggressive. The very much problematic ones are the top right to infiltrative. So if you look at that, it just looks like little blood vessels, little red areas, and looks nothing like our classical appearance. But you just know in areas around the nose, potentially the eyelid, that you get these BCCs that just track along the skin. And if there's any little break, and we'll go on to what that is, but it dives down. And it would be very difficult to draw a line around that and say, that's where it is, we need to excise it. Because on, this, on the nose also, particularly, it's very vascular, you get little vessels. And so ones like that are hugely challenging to treat because you don't quite know where it begins and ends. And we'll go on to what the options are for that. But nodular BCC, common, the commonest type, and easily excised because you can see a margin. The superficial ones are ones we'll talk about. Actually, you don't have to cut them out. There are other ways to treat them. And the infiltrative are the most challenging from a surgical perspective. <clears throat> and really, where do you get them? Well, it's the sun-exposed sites because it's an accumulation of sun exposure. But Head and neck, very common. And you can see this patient, if you've had one, you like to get another, and he's obviously had a huge amount of sun exposure and something within him makes him perceptible to this. It doesn't mean he's got a genetic condition. Um, it can mean he's got Gorlin syndrome, which is the genetic condition commonly associated with BCCs, but he, but he may just have had a lot of sun exposure, but challenging patients. And then the other area is the trunk. So they're more easy to deal with, I'd say. But you may need to do different things. So some of these on this gentleman's face may be treated non-surgically, some may require surgery. So we'll talk initially about surgical management for BCCs, which can be a bit more varied than SCCs. And we'll talk about non-surgical and surgical. Um, and then these can broadly be applied to SCCs as well. Um, but really we're talking about well circumscribed or, or non-circumscribed. For non-surgical management, this is really those superficial ones that we saw in the last slide. That's very well treated by it. The other patient cohorts that may be treated non-surgically are very elderly, people with comorbidities such as dementia who wouldn't tolerate surgery, wouldn't tolerate other treatments like radiotherapy, so you may treat them with something else. And then of course, if you say you don't want surgery, then that's your choice and we'll go into what the different options are. Um, for surgery, a nodular one, well circumscribed, you can remove. And then infiltrative, essentially think of it like a tree. It's, you can see something on the surface, but it's got roots that are going under the skin and, not, and it may not be obvious on the skin. And you may actually find 
that it goes much further and is much more extensive than you imagined. So what are the different options? For the non-surgical side, cryotherapy, so freezing it with liquid nitrogen. Photodynamic therapy, this is essentially where you put a topical cream, which is acid-based, but you put a cream on the lesion, very good for the superficial BCCs, and then you expose it to light. <clears throat> now, typically this has been done with, almost it's not, it's not using um, light like a tanning salon, but it, it applies a short burst of light to basically kill the cells on the top layer by activating the amino lebulinic acid. Um, the second option, which is a newer option, is actually to expose yourself to sunlight. So that is UV. Um, it's only obviously used in this country in summer months, and obviously it helps if it's a decent day. But that's the second option. But that's photodynamic therapy, very good for superficial BCCs and precancerous lesions. Topical treatments will come on too. There's a couple of options, which is essentially a cream provokes quite an intense reaction. So if you put it outside of the lesion itself on normal skin, it can be quite irritating and uncomfortable and can create a wound. And the final non-surgical option is radiotherapy. So treatment with x-ray treatment, and that is very effective. And the clearance rates for that for BCCs of any form are about 85 to 90%. So it's, it's good. The downside is you don't know if it's been completely effective. You only know as and when it comes back because you've never sent off a specimen to pathology. You just treat it with x-rays and it tends to disappear. Um, but the bonus is you don't get any scarring from surgery, you avoid that. But the skin changes that it provokes and, and that surrounding skin as well, tend to develop with time. So you get very thin skin, it can peel, it can be prone to burning in the sun. So there are, there are trade-offs with that, but it tends to be effective at cure. Surgical options, there are three really. And ones that dermatologists use quite a bit but can be effective for fairly big lesions in elderly patients who may have reasons why they they don't they're not suitable for a standard surgical approach is essentially putting local anesthetic in and curetting so scraping the lesion off and then you buzz it with diathermy to seal off any bleeding vessels you tend to do that three times you do three passes to remove the roots of the bcc um, you can send it off for pathology it tells you it's a bcc but you never know if you've got a clear margin of normal skin around it. So it's about 80% effective, can push up to 85%. It's a substandard surgical option, but you will find some patients where it's, it's a reasonable thing to do, usually because it would need a complex reconstruction and they wouldn't be a suitable candidate for that. So when you've curetted it and, and, and sealed off any bleeding vessels, then what you do is you leave that to heal by itself and all things heal under the right circumstances. Most common thing we do is standard surgery. So you've got a lesion, you draw around it to mark the edges, you then do a margin of normal skin and you excise it and you send it off for pathology, which usually takes two to three weeks and <clears throat> it tells you if it's all clear or not. What you do in 99% of cases is you remove it with that technique and you either stitch it closed or do a reconstruction. Reconstruction is broadly either a skin graft or moving some skin in with a blood supply and that's a skin flap. So good things about that, it's a one-stop shop. You remove it and stitch it closed in the same sitting. The downsides of it are you don't know if the tumor is clear at the time of reconstructing it or stitching it closed. You have to wait two or three weeks for the result. And then 95% of the time, if you take a, a decent margin of normal skin and we'll come onto that, it's clear. However, in the 5% or more in the more complex tumors that it's incomplete, you're then left with a problem because you've got to go back and treat again, either radiotherapy is an option or cut some more out. But if you've done a reconstruction and move skin in, it, ch it changes the, the orientation of it really so do you cut away the tissue you've moved in and the deeper layers and the sides if it's present there where do you start where do you stop it, it, it's a headache and they're definitely at a high risk of it coming back whatever you do and then the final thing i'll explain in more detail is Mohs surgery which is very much an interest of mine as it's mainly done by dermatology who then pass the patient on for reconstruction to a plastic surgeon um, but there are about five of us in the country who have trained in both Mohs surgery and plastic surgery. So it's a way of removing the tumor, analyzing it's all clear on the same day, and then 
closing the wound by stitching, by a skin graft or skin flap at the same time. What it essentially is, is marking the tumor and the edges of it, removing it as a layer. Then the patient has a dressing on, waits for a bit, and you look at it under the microscope, see if it's clear. If it's not, the patient comes back in, you remove another layer and check if it's clear. Once it's clear, you do the reconstruction. So it's, it's more time consuming, but for complex tumors, and they're the ones you're doing, the complex BCCs or SCCs, it's, it's very good at just ensuring clearance before doing a reconstruction. And the cure rates for that are 99%. And that really just allows a 1% margin of error for inaccurate reading of the slides or orientation, you've made an error, basically operator error, but 99% clearance versus about 95% for standard surgery at most. Um, versus about 85 to 90 for the other options. So non-surgical treatment, top right picture, liquid nitrogen. You basically, it's, you may have seen it. It's basically like a canister, like a flask. It has a little handle on it and it fires out a liquid nitrogen, which appears white on the skin. So that's the, the end of the canister, the, 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 uh, the gold end. And you can see them fire it onto a lesion and it basically freezes and kills the cells. So you can get a little wound. Bottom right, this is a patient who's having photodynamic therapy. They've had the creams applied to the problem areas um, for usually a superficial BCC or a pre-malignant problem. And then they are exposed to light for a short burst and it basically activates the aminolebulinic acid and then kills the top layer of cells on the skin. The topical options, there are two. 5-fluorouracil is one that's essentially a chemotherapy agent, um, goes under the trade name of Epudic, so bottom left, and that provokes an intense reaction. The other option is Aldara or Amiquimod um, next to it, and they're immunomodulators. They tend to stimulate an immune response and involve the immune system locally. We tend to use it with caution in transplant patients, um, and these creams are very effective in transplant patients because, as I say, they have a huge, in hugely increased risk of SCCs, but with that go lots of precancerous lesions and skin changes where you're not sure. So the creams are very effective, but you just have to use the immunomodulators with a bit of caution because they're immunosuppressed. Final non-surgical treatment, radiotherapy. As I said, very good cure rates of about 85 to 90%. Improvements in the safety profile because they're now very much more targeted. So super, more superficial for skin tumors than they were. Whereas previously, if you had a lesion here, it may also go very deep definitely through the full layer down to the bone maybe even give um, irradiation to the brain so obviously not good so now it's much more effective you have a narrower field so you target a smaller area um, and radiotherapy in itself is carcinogenic so you can invoke tumors with time but that's much less now because of its improvements in technology if you like um, you don't ever know if you've cleared the tumor because you don't have pathological proof but it disappears. But then you get some chronic skin changes. They get worse with time. It's very much dryness, irritation, thinning of the skin, and, and you can get redness. So there are trade-offs. The typical radiotherapy course is an absolute minimum of coming once a day, Monday to Friday, for two weeks. For bigger tumors, it might be four to six weeks. So if the elderly patient's saying, oh, I don't want surgery, I couldn't tolerate it, you can offer radiotherapy, but it's quite a time commitment because by the time they've got to hospital, had the radiotherapy, left hospital. You're probably talking about a morning or an afternoon each day for anything two, four, six weeks. So logistically, it's quite a trade-off as well. So it's not the absolute answer to people who don't want surgery. <clears throat> and then the first surgical treatment, curatage and cautery, a cure rate of 80% could be a bit higher. You have a lesion. This one, I think if you had an elderly patient, you may just excise it. They've got to have local anesthetic anyway, um, so you can curette it, but there doesn't seem much point. But it's an example of what the curette looks like, um, and you basically scrape it, buzz it, any bleeding vessels, do another pass, and then do a third pass. That's the typical process that dermatologists do, curatage and cautery times three is what they tend to do. So they've done three passes, and you may get down through, all the way through the skin, you leave a wound, and you leave it to heal by itself. Now, it should well heal, Malignant wounds with malignancy still in them tend not to heal, so you should know if it's cleared or not actually. Um, but obviously, there's a good chance of it coming back, probably about 
Um, and the limitations really are you've got a wound to heal then. So a wound even this size will take two or three weeks. Um, and you're typically doing on people who are probably candidates for poor wound healing. And that's why you've done the procedure in the first place. So elderly, maybe on steroids, may smoke, maybe on blood thinners. There's lots of reasons why it may have problems healing, but it has its limitations, but it, there's certainly a place for it. So now to surgical treatment. So people always talk about margins. And I think there are, there's evidence and fairly weak evidence, but the classic one people cite is if you do a four millimeter margin for a well circumscribed BCC, so like that nodular one we saw, you could clearly draw a line around it, then you will clear it 95% of the time. So one in 20 only won't be clear. But the problem is <clears throat> if you've got a BCC, which is eight millimeters in diameter, that's quite small. So you're saying you've got to double the size of the excision to remove it with a four millimeter margin. So you go from eight millimeters to 16. So you're actually taking quite a lot of normal skin. If you're talking about it on the face, the cheek probably less of a problem, but you're talking about quite a big scar. Really, if you've got a, if you're taking, say, a, for argument's sake, a one, you draw your normal margin of skin around it, say the lesion is then a centimeter. If you want to excise something as an ellipse so you can stitch it closed, that should be three to four times as long. So all of a sudden, a one centimeter, well, a lesion with one centimeter excision becomes four centimeter scar. So we're talking about quite big scars, really, but four millimeters is the quoted figure to get 95% clearance. If it's like the infiltrative pattern on the nose that we saw, and you, you wouldn't even be sure where it starts and ends, you couldn't draw a line around it because it's so vague, then actually the evidence suggests you need to take a one and a half centimeter margin around what you think is the tumor to get 95% out. Now, that's obviously gonna leave a huge defect. So you can see the problem. You tend to do something less, but you get a high rate of incomplete excision. So a clearly circumscribed one, yes, 95% clear, but most aren't like that, particularly on the face. And what you actually find is that you get probably more than one in 20 incompletely excised. It's more like one in, one in 10, one in eight with the complex ones. And then the problem is, what do you do? You've reconstructed them with a stitching, skin graft, skin flap, and it's incomplete when you find the results out three weeks later. So you have to bring the patient back. You have to tell them you've, what you've taken is inadequate and you're going to have to take more. But as I said, if it's at the edges, you can take more, but then what are you going to do about stitching? If it's the deep edge and you've done a skin graft, you're going to have to cut away the skin graft, take out more at the deep edge, and then what you do, you could dress it and wait for the results. You could hope for the best, cross your fingers, reconstruct it, but you've still got to wait two or three weeks for the results. You can see the headaches. Most people will be fine, but it's not the option for everyone. And some of these lesions extend under the epidermis. So you can't actually see where the roots extend to. And that's particularly the infiltrative pattern. Um, you can see the problems and I'm going to come on to this. This is a BCC on the eyelid. And if you look just at the, the margin near the iris, then you can see the little bit of notching. So it's, it's contracting, it's retracted it, and it's locally aggressive. <clears throat> if you look slightly to the left as we look at or the patient's right, on the eyelid margin just above the hairs, you can see there's another area that you might think, mm, is that similar to the tumor in the middle? And there's a little bit of discoloration, that sort of reddy orange look. Is that tumor? Is it not? If you're going to excise it conventionally, you're going to leave a reasonable defect, which could probably be stitched closed and leaving a, a tight eyelid, but you may find it's still present. So that's the headache of just standard surgical treatment. It suits most people, but it's not the absolute be all and end all. So then what we come on to is Mohs surgery and it is the gold standard, particularly for high risk tumors. So that means they're aggressive and they extend a long way like the infiltrative pattern and also for ones on the eyelid nose sensitive areas. Why do it? Well, it, it, you look at the margins, so the, the sides and the underneath at the time of doing the surgery. Um, and you do this tumor analysis on the same day before reconstructing. Three big advantages really. When you mark out the lesion, <clears throat> you draw around it what you think is the edge. Normally you will do a four millimeter margin to get 95% out. In most surgery, you will do a one millimeter margin. Now you might find after the first excision, there's still some there. But you essentially look at it like a clock face. I'm going to show you a video of this. 
So if it's present at nine o'clock, you don't have to go all the way around the whole thing. You just go back to nine o'clock. So that's the advantage is that you're going to preserve normal tissue, leave a smaller defect. The clearance rate is 99%, so the best available. So only 1% of patients will come back with a recurrence, and that's usually due to some, it could be, there's a lot of gray areas in pathology is what I'd say. So normal structures can look like tumor and vice versa. Um, and then it's also, particularly an eyelid nose, to know you've got clear margins, you can then embark on a complex reconstruction because you have no worries that the tumor's out. What people might do, very indistinct tumor, is put a skin graft on where it wouldn't be the best reconstruction because if it's still positive, then it's the easiest thing to manage. So whereas Mohs, you get the best, best possible control of the tumor prior to embarking on it. And the disadvantages, as you can tell, it's time consuming. So you do take it one excision, you look at it, takes about 45 minutes to process and look at, it's still there. The patient has to come back in, have a bit more local anesthetic, go back out, look at the slides again. I mean, that can continue a number of times if it's a complex BCC, um, <clears throat> but ultimately you get the best result. And many units have a dermatologist, as I said, doing the excision, and then anything beyond stitching the wound closed, such as a skin graft or flap, they then ask a plastic surgeon to reconstruct it, and that's usually on another day. So the patient has a wound and a, essentially a hole in their face for anything from one, two days, which is the usual in this country, to up to a week in other countries. So that's not ideal and hence why I've trained in it to try and do an integrated service. It's only two other places in the country that do that, but you can excise it, look at it and reconstruct it all in the same sitting. So certainly the best thing for the patients. So really the BCC is the iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg that you see on the skin and these aggressive ones extend deep with roots and can go much further than you anticipate. So Hopefully this plays fine. So most surgery, you see a lesion on the nose, you can see the edge of the tumor, and then you draw around it as they have here with the purple pen. Um, and instead of taking four millimeters, which would be much bigger, you've just taken a very small margin. Inject with local anesthetic, cut the tumor out. When that's done, you're then going to put a dressing on and take it to the lab. Now these nicks they're making here are that clock face so that you know where 12 o'clock and they've done a three o'clock nick as well because you're gonna to have to orientate this circular disc so that if an area is positive, you can go back and take that margin. So you freeze it down, you make slices, you stain it and you look at it under the microscope and look at the slides. What you're looking at here is normal in the lower half. And then really it's pattern recognition. You can see at the top part, the darker stained areas, that is BCC. So the epidermis is the layer next to the white and that's nodular BCC that you can see. So you know it was at that margin. So you just take that bit. You don't have to go back and take the whole circumference and then it's gone. So in two stages, patients had to come in and out twice. You managed to get the tumor clear. So that very much is the gold standard. It's predominantly used 98% of the time for BCCs. It is an option for SCCs and we'll come on to that now. So SCCs, the appearance can be quite like BCCs and that's normally the differential diagnosis. Classically, same as, S, as BCCs, it's raised, it has a rolled edge, it has ulceration in the center, but you tend not to see the little blood vessels the same. Um, <clears throat> And what you can find is they smell a bit and they fungate because of the uh, really a greater area of keratin. So you can see the central yellow plug, that is the keratosis that you classically see in SCCs. But they can look like other things. You remember seeing the red patch in BCCs. You can also get that in, in SCCs where you get this scaling red patch. And that's usually pre-malignant, to be honest, rather than um, something invasive. But this back of the hand, a common location, a sun exposed site, and it just looks a bit more aggressive than that other red patch of BCC because you've got this darkened crusting area. It's a bit black. It may have been bleeding. And then the, the final one to really think of, you often get referred a patient elderly and they say they've had a wound on their leg. It's been there for a year and it's never healed. I think the thing to say is under the right conditions, all wounds will heal. Now, there's a few caveats, obviously, but there are reasons why people have wounds on their legs. And it's usually an ulcer. And it's commonly 
from venous disease, it can be from arterial disease, or it can be from diabetes. So three good reasons why you would have an ulcer on the leg. But often people say, oh, I had a bit of minor trauma. And people often correlate non-melanoma skin cancers to minor trauma. Um, and they often say, oh, I had that, and it's just never healed. But actually the reality is they probably, it, there may be a link, very rarely, but they had a wound and because of a malignant process, it doesn't ever heal. So if you ever asked about a patient who has a non-healing wound, a biopsy is usually a good idea to determine if it's malignant. And the eponymous name is a margulins ulcer. What we really want to know with SCCs is <clears throat> the high risk ones, because actually you see the bottom bit, only about 5% get metastatic spread. So it spreads to the regional lymph nodes. So that means 95% are fine. So which ones are the problems? And there's a, a new-ish staging system from Boston in the US where they've identified four key determinants. So is it greater than two centimeters? Differentiation is the degree of change from the original cell. So if the options are poor, moderately, and well. So poorly differentiated being the one that looks nothing like the original cell. So the one that's changed most dramatically from the squamous cell to being unrecognizable has the worst worst outcomes if you like perineural invasion so it doesn't have to be a named nerve but there are multiple small cutaneous sensory nerves and what you find when you look under the microscope is that around that nerve sheath the tumor is tracked along it and that's a very poor prognostic factor because it spreads along the nerve sheath and goes into other areas and that's when it gets into the lymphatics um, and then invasion deep to fat. It's spread deep, it's, it's wanting to be aggressive. But those four factors are key because if you have two or more of them, then your risk of metastasis is 30%. So a 30% chance your tumor is gonna go into the lymphatics and spread to regional lymph nodes, and then ultimately the risk of, of mortality. So it's important to identify those high risk factors because instead of your risk of metastasis being three to 5%, it's actually 30%. And if you have all four, then your risk is 50 to 60%. So it's always quite nice to stratify these patients and look for the, the problem ones. And then a metastasis. So what do you do? The patient says they've had a tumor two years ago on, on, the, on the face. You know it was an SCC. You think it was fairly high risk, but they've come and they say, oh, I've got a lump in the neck. So ultimately what you want to know is, is this tumor? And the simplest thing to do is usually it's with radiology and they do an ultrasound scan. If it's as obvious as this, that obvious as this, they may not need to, but they essentially stick a needle in it to take some cells and that's fine needle aspiration. They put it on a slide and they can tell if they're malignant or not. Um, and that's what you do for any mass in the neck. For a lump in the neck, you do a fine needle aspiration. What you want to know is how the disease is spread and your classical staging in the very beginning has been bloods and x-ray with, with advances in radiology. It's now CT staging has become standard. And then more recently, PET-CT, so positron emission tomography and then CT scan. It's really a combination of two tests in nuclear medicine. So CT scan gives the anatomical um, radiological appearance. A PET scan essentially highlights hotspots. So a hot spot being any area of increased cell turnover. Now, if you have an infection, it comes up as a hot spot. But what we're really looking for is hot spots of malignant change, so high cell turnover. So in this patient, it would come up in the neck. What you want to know is are there other areas in the neck which are much smaller, or is there anything in the chest, say, have we had spread to there? Um, but if you have had regional disease, you have a lump in the neck, the treatment of this is then to clear the lymph node, so a lymphadenectomy with a neck dissection. Um, for SCCs, if you get it distant spread, so into the chest, disease which is unresectable in the last year, there's an immunotherapy, so a drug which stimulates the immune system to fight off the cancer. The big use of this is in melanoma, but there is an option for SCC. Or the other things are if you have distant spread, palliative chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So just to touch, what do you do when you see a patient? This patient on the top comes to you. GP refers them in, you take a history, how long has it been there for? Has it been there for a few weeks, few months? That looks typically like a BCC, but in the history they'll typically say, I've had it for six months, it's grown slowly, and I've lived abroad for two years, probably had some sunburn, and I'm now 70. Um, so all of a sudden you've got a clear picture, someone who's had sun exposure, there's a slow growing lesion, it's been there for months, 
and it's not caused great problems because they haven't got any lumps anywhere else. They're otherwise well. And the question really is, what are you going to do with them? So it's well circumscribed versus not well circumscribed. It's most likely a BCC because it's got that pearly appearance. It's got the rolled edges. It's got the little blood vessels, the telangiectasia, but probably no ulceration. Now you might say, well, the SCCs have the rolled edges and you're right, you can be surprised, but I think the little blood vessels of telangiectasia really point towards that being a BCC. Now, what are you going to do with it is the next question. You want to treat it. Now, some tumours, which are BCCs, look like non-malignant things. I think with this, you're leaning towards it being malignant. But you might say, do you know what? Some sebaceous gland overgrowth can look like this. And if I cut out this whole thing with a big margin, the scar is going to be huge. And actually, it was a benign problem. So you might say, I just need to take a little bit of it. And you take a little biopsy. So that's either a punch or an incision, so use a blade. What you're most likely to say is it, it looks just like a BCC. And because it's well demarcated, I know that if I do a scar along the length of the nose, I can stitch it closed. I'm confident that this will be out all in one go. I'm going to do that. So for that top one, what you're most likely to do is say it's a BCC. I'm going to excise it in the local anesthetic and stitch it closed. What margin? Well, four millimeters gives 95% clearance. But this is so well demarcated, you might get away with a bit less, but it's a bit of a judgment call. The bottom one, <clears throat> you see the red area centrally, pretty small. Then there's a bit of vague redness around it. And it even, if you look up to the light reflex about a centimetre above it, there's a blood vessel there. So is that also tumour? Now, you know that if you cut this out, it's on the edge of the nose. You can't just stitch it together because it's going to deform the nose. So you might do a little biopsy on that first. There'd be a good argument for that. Um, comes back as BCC and you just think the edges are completely indistinct. So the option probably there is Mohs surgery because you're going to need quite a complex reconstruction for that. And the options broadly are a skin graft, which will cause probably some retraction of the, the rim of the nose, so lift it up. It'll always look like a patch and it'll be a different thickness. So then you might think you want to do something more complex and you can borrow a bit of the ear and put it in as a graft, the full thickness. That would work quite well. Or you can do a more complex reconstruction from the forehead or the cheek. Um, but that is a very difficult area to reconstruct. So that's why you might go much more conservative on the bottom picture than the top. And always remember there's other treatments like radiotherapy, but both of these look more involved than just a superficial BCC that you could treat with a cream or you could treat with photodynamic therapy or liquid nitrogen but top one you can excise bottom one you're more likely to go for a biopsy first just to touch on pre-malignant lesions so yes all of these can become invasive cancers what's the likelihood well we don't know really but it's probably the order of three to five percent for actinic keratosis but they're extremely common and anything that looks crusty in an elderly person is probably one of these They've got that yellow keratosis, they're slightly red and they're scaling. Um, you usually have lots of them. Scalp of old men is a common area when they're bald. Um, and it's actually, if you think there's a bit of a wound there or it's very extensive, you might want to do a little biopsy rather than remove the whole thing, but you can remove the whole thing. But ultimately these are very well treated with freezing, with topical creams. Another topical cream is, is actually diclofenac called Solarase. Bowen's disease is squamous cell carcinoma in situ, so it's pre-malignant. You tend to get them being slightly more clearly demarcated than the redness of actinic keratosis, and they're a red scaling macule. Um, again, three to five percent may progress to SCC, and you can use topical treatments, but if they're quite resistant to that for whatever reason, then we do excise them sometimes. And then this is a really funny one. I mean, this is an awful position on the, by the eyelid on this patient, but KA or keratoacanthoma, the long name. We don't quite know if this clinically or pathologically is an invasive cancer. Some people say it's benign. Some say it's a low grade squamous cell carcinoma. But when you look at it, it looks like an SCC. <coughs> when you look at it under the microscope as a pathologist, it looks like an SCC. But the general feeling is it's either very low grade or benign. And they have a very typical course of the patient will tell you it's grown rapidly for two months and they present you in clinic. And then you're left with, well, what do we do? It looks like an SCC, but it could be this low grade problem. 
but actually if you left alone it typically has a latent period where it's quiet and then pretty much disappears you may have some sort of skin expansion as a bit of a scar but it disappears but do you want to wait six months for that to happen in case it's a squamous cell carcinoma which is aggressive but it looks dome shaped so you can see it's slightly more elevated it tends to have that central keratin plug that really just makes it look slightly different to other SCCs. But most of the time with these patients, they present to you at two or three months, say it's grown really quickly and you opt to excise it. And then the final thing, what we're primarily interested in is plastic surgery is treating the skin cancer, but then also the complex reconstruction. And Mohs surgery in particular is great for tumors on the eyelid and the nose where you want to conserve skin and make sure the tumor is clear before the most complex reconstruction. So this short video just talks about options. You can leave anything alone and the right conditions will heal, but it, scars tend to contract. But if you, if you left a scar by the edge of the nose, it would tend to pull it up, but you can leave things. The other option is to stitch it closed as an ellipse. You wouldn't normally make it as long as this, but you can see how you need to make it quite a bit longer than the tumor itself. Um, and then there's other options, a local flap. So moving a piece of skin on a blood supply, it doesn't have to be named, that's a bilobed flap. And you borrow skin from elsewhere where it's more mobile, the upper nose, and move it to the immobile skin on the lower nose. Um, and then there are other more extensive options that you can come to, but you get the idea that there's different options. This just goes through in a little more detail. It shows another one, you can see it's from the start of our previous video that you excise the, it for Mohs surgery, you look at it under the microscope, make sure it's all clear. That's the, that's the tumor, you can see the circular bit. So you need to make it typically three times as long to avoid little excesses, excesses of skin at the upper and lower ends of the scar. A bilobed flap, stitch it in, borrowing from the upper nose really, and we can do another talk another day about that. And then this is a very extensive flap, it's called a Riga flap. The blood supply is coming in from near the, the corner of the eyelid, from the facial artery, um, but a very extensive flap. You have to undermine the whole nose to bring that down. Prognosis, well, BCCs, you tell the patient they're cured if it's excised with a clear margin. Risk of recurrence, 1% with Mohs, 3% for the very clearly demarcated lesions, more commonly 5%, but for the, the sort of lesions where you can't draw a clear line around it, 15 to 20 percent. Um, that's where Mohs really comes into its own and if it's completely excised you don't need to follow them up. Um, SECs, complete excision is what you're after. Um, risk of metastasis is about three to five percent and risk of death about 2.8 percent but conversely most people don't have a problem but we do follow up patients with SECs so you'll typically go for a four monthly routine surveillance where when you've removed an SEC you look at the scar you examine the lymph nodes and you do a full skin check just to make sure nothing's recurred in the lymph nodes particularly around the scar or nothing new has appeared and that's everything for non-melanoma skin cancer thank you for listening any questions Um, does anyone want to type their questions into the chat and uh, we'll take questions, otherwise um, you can ask them at the end of the other talk as well. I think just I'll add on, I mean it's very much a talk on skin cancer. I think the, the thing that gets us most excited as plastic surgeons is my interest alongside Mohs is, is the facial reconstruction and certainly another tool, but it's just, I want to give you a bit of a flavor of, of options. And really there's lots of parts of the face that can have skin borrowed from and easily closed. The cheek, clearly you can stitch that closed most of the time. Patients are elderly, the skin expansion, so they have an excess. Um, lower third of the nose and the eyelid, much more complex. Um, because obviously what you're trying to achieve is remove a tumour, which then leaves quite a big defect, but restore it to as it was before. Um, so there's lots more to say on that, but 
it's certainly the interesting area. There's obviously a lots of skin cancers we deal with on the trunk um, and elsewhere on the body, but the face is really the, the complex area and why I think dermatology, lots of the excisions as well um, on the trunk and limbs, we tend to do the ones on the face um, and Mose is the gold standard really, just so you can do those complex reconstructions. Probably the bits we didn't talk about in terms of surgery, I mentioned in the next one, but is removal of lymph nodes, often done by plastic surgeons. We're really talking about neck dissections, auxiliary clearance and groin dissections. There's a couple of variations, but that's 99.9% .9 of them. Um, some of the neck dissections are by ENT and maxillofacial surgery. Um, it was, it's mainly for melanoma or was, and I'll come on to why that's different, but very much was a gold standard skin cancer operation, but other treatments are coming in as, as with other cancers where oncology is, is rapidly changing in terms of medical therapy and, and is the way forward. So things do change, but these tumors, I don't think anything's on the landscape for non-melanoma skin cancer to, to change how we treat them surgically. Um, and I think really these tend to be the interesting skin cancers now because so many are on the face. Melanoma was really the big, the big field, but as we'll go on to, things have, have changed and it's not always on the face, it's frequently other areas. And we've got a question. Um, what is the acid released in photodynamic therapy? So I have to double check the spelling a bit. The, there's a couple of different types. Um, it goes on essentially like a cream or paste. And it's called amino lebulinic acid. Um, I can I can find some. It tends to be done by dermatologists, not done by us. There are different ones. I hope I've got that right because it's not something that involves us too much. Um, but then you just it basically gets activated by exposure to sunlight. Um, it can often be overlooked by plastic surgeons because we're, we're not involved in, in its provision at all. But um, it, it's certainly a very effective thing because lots of these patients haven't got one lesion. They've got 10 and they're all quite superficial. You wouldn't cut them all out. Otherwise, say on the scalp, it's going to be the whole half the scalp or the whole scalp. So that's where really topical treatments come into their own. And we're very much guided by our dermatology colleagues. Oh, and the other question is, um, why is that that BCCs never metastasize? That is a very, very good question. <laughs> and it, it really, why that is, is not completely understood. It's a bit, I think it's probably difficult to understand when we, where we don't have a great grasp on their origin. We, we're still arguing about where they come from, but we know they're from keratinocytes. There are a group of cancers that are similar to this where they're very locally aggressive and they don't spread and we don't really know why but for some reason they don't go again to the lymphatics or the blood supply to metastasize and i don't think we fully understand why scts for instance typically metastasize by the lymphatics but then there are other malignancies so you tend to get local regional disease for sccs if you've got an scc on the scalp you're quite likely to develop problems in the head and neck but you're unlikely to get distant metastases. Melanoma is the reverse in that you get hematogenous spread as well as lymphatic, and you may well die of distant metastases. So SCC's local recurrence and problems causing death, melanoma, distant metastases. So that why the cancers behave like that, we don't know, but for the local spread only, you're right, because it's a cancer because it passes through the basement membrane, but why it doesn't spread, we don't know. The other tumour or principal tumour that we deal with that's like that is a rare sarcoma. Short DFSP is its abbreviated name. And we see it rarely, but it's very, very aggressive locally. And it can be cured by cutting it out completely. But when I talk about roots of a tree, they are much more invasive and extensive than a BCC. So you tend to have to have, do huge excisions for that. So it stands for dermatofibroma sarcoma protuberance so it's a type of sarcoma <clears throat> and again why does that not metastasize it's hugely aggressive locally very destructive but it doesn't spread more work to be done really but we don't we don't know the exact reason there's different theories postulated but we don't quite know uh, one other question um do sccs for two more actually do sccs um why do sccs present with an inverted edge um, you mean the role, well, the, 
do you mean the rolled edge with the little keratin dip? I think it, the keratin bit is because of the type of cell. So the SEC is slightly different. As I said, it, it, it starts in the basal layer or near the basal layer, probably the spinosum layer. And all normal cells, they pass up through the epidermis, go into that stratum corneum, which is essentially dead cells which form keratoses. And that's what the this keratin plug is. It's as the SCC travels up through the epidermis, it has that keratin area. And essentially it's a bit of necrosis. It's a dead area of the central SCC and that's the sharp edge with the keratin plug. The rolled edges, that's just the way it grows. And not all of them grow like that, but I assume when you say the, that, it's about the keratin plug, which is really the growth th through the epidermis as a malignancy and the central area of necrosis. So it's malignant cells cause necrosis really if left and SEC is aggressive in that sense. Um, I think someone's given the, uh, oh, the clarification. Um, yeah, like B they thought BCCs present with a rolled edge and SCCs with the nevastid edge. So but I think, um, is, that, is that clear? It, it, I think the problem is there's lots of different types of each. So yeah, classically the BCCs are a rolled edge, but those pictures I showed of SCCs also have a rolled edge. Um, so I think it depends where you are. The classical appearance on the face is that they both look quite similar with the rolled edge. In the everted or well, inverted edge, on the lower limbs you tend to get more of a wound. So that's the inverted one, so it goes the other way. Um, but it depends which type. The BCCs tend to have named types, so nodular being the rolled edge. You can get an ulcerated BCC, which is also inverted and, and goes in. So they can both look similar to each other, but the classical appearance of an, of an SEC, it also has a similarly rolled edge with the keratin in the middle and that central ulceration. So they look quite similar apart from the telangiectasia, little blood vessels, but it's a classical appearance, but there isn't really one type of each. There are multiple types of both, but they're quite right. The SECs can present with that difference and they tend to present with a bit more of an ulceration. Um, that's usually on the legs of elderly patients. Um, and another question, do you use any biomarkers for diagnosis? Um, we don't, but it's something that's being looked into um, as in different studies. Could it be used as a screening, particularly for transplant patients? Um, it's used quite a bit in melanoma. We'll come on to that um, to look for mutations regarding treatment. Um, but we don't use any biomarkers at the moment. There's a colleague who's up in Leeds, he's looking at biomarkers in melanoma particularly, but we want to, BCCs, because they don't spread, are slightly neglected, and SCCs have typically been sort of the poor relation of melanoma in terms of research and looking at these things. They're the neglected group because they're sort of in the middle of BCCs and melanoma. So biomarkers really have, have come from melanoma. That's where things have been driven, but there's nothing we use routinely now. Do SCCs and BCCs present differently in darker skin tones? Um, they can do. You can, you can get both in darker skin tones, but the only ones I've seen when I worked in Malawi, SCCs typically in the patients who had albinism and BCCs looked quite similar as a big wound, rolled edges, necrosis centrally because it was neglected for so long and it was thought to be an SCC but it was actually a BCC which was highly unusual but they tend to look the same you're more likely in, in darker skin tones particularly with an SCC to get the ulceration so instead of that nodular lesion the rolled edges you're more likely as, as whoever was asking the question said much more likely to get the ulceration uh, that's the only difference but equally they're both much much less common in darker skin tones because it's predominantly related to UV light. Very, very unusual for us to be operating on people with darker skin tones. <clears throat> so uh, I think that's all for now. I'm just going to put the um, feedback form link into the chat and um, if anyone wants to drop off, um, yeah, Very please good. fill that out. And um, I think we can continue with the second part. No problem at all. If anyone has any further questions about that talk after this one, please, please do let me know. And anything that would be useful to add into it going forward as well, um, that would be that would be helpful. So I'd be pleased if you could let me know on the feedback form. Right. Let's see.
Right, so having been through non-melanoma skin cancer, we're going to melanoma, and some of the principles around melanoma um, will very much apply from the non-melanoma talk. So we'll talk a bit about what melanoma is, talk about how it forms, who gets it, and then again, the assessment, the prognosis and management. And things that are melanomas can look <clears throat> fairly innocuous. I mean, you might get someone coming to clinic with this, and oh, well, I think I knocked it and it bled and you might argue that the top part of that, the red bit, looks like it's a bit of bruising and bleeding, but any lesion that's pigmented, definitely in medical school exams, but the question always is, is it a melanoma, the most aggressive form of skin cancer with a, with a previously and still fairly high mortality rate? So something like this looks fairly innocuous initially. The patient sort of downplays it, but the worry has got to be that it's melanoma. And assessing these lesions will come to a strategy of how you look at it and really ask is it something which is aggressive or not and there's a simple technique to do that so the same pictures we saw before the melanocytes reside in the lower levels of the epidermis either the basal cell layer or just above that in the stratum spinosum so the same areas as bcc's and scc's originate from the difference is it's the most aggressive form of skin cancer and it's relatively common in young patients, and that's because UV light again is the issue, um, but the difference being it's short bursts of it, so multiple episodes of sunburn, use of sunbeds. And again, people who are at risk skin tones, typically type one and two Fitzpatrick skin type, um, who are fair skinned, regularly burn or always burn, they're the ones that are at risk of this. And importantly, it's increasing in instance. <clears throat> So just a, a look at the graph going from 75 to 2010 of in Europe, what was the incidence? You can see we rapidly went fourfold, went from four per hundred thousand to 16 per hundred thousand um, by population. So a massive increase. Now, lots of reasons postulated for this. You could say, is it the etiology of its changed climate change, places where fair skinned people are living, hole in the ozone is the Australian reason that was often given, or was it higher awareness of the condition? Um, there were certainly pushes in the 80s and 90s in Australia, one of the pioneers of it, for public awareness. So were doctors and the public more aware of things that could be melanoma, it was increased, but actually we think it's just increasing as a cancer, and it's one of the top 10 malignancies in terms of incidence in the UK. So now, it's not 16 per 100,000, it's 20 per 100,000 a year in the UK. Australia has two and a half times that rate. And actually Queensland, so North Eastern Australia, again, lots of European emigration to there over the last 100 years and more. They actually have about 75 per 100,000 per year. And that's the highest rate in the world. So that's really what drove Australia to, to push on with public awareness and doctor awareness because Yes, it's relatively common, but if you're a GP, how many cases of melanoma do you see in your career? Probably not huge numbers, but if you work in a dermatology or plastic surgery service for skin cancer, you see a lot. <clears throat> so the advertisement is now an old one, but I think that's from Australia. That was very much um, slip, slap, slop was their slogan of seek out the shade being the first bit, but wear a shirt to cover the skin, put a hat and sunglasses on, put sun cream on and it's high factor SPF 50 UVA and UVB light um, which which needs to be worn. So what we have noted with time the incidence has increased and the there has been a reduction in mortality and what, what's been noted really was that a lot more a lot of earlier stage melanomas were being identified so people were more aware of it you had a mole you think it's grown and whereas in the past it was ignored, people didn't know anything about melanoma, you just got a, a generation who would present to a GP or, or a dermatologist who said, I'm not sure about this, it was removed, and it was an early stage melanoma. So you got a lot more of that type of melanoma which were less aggressive being identified. So that partly contributed to a reduction in the mortality. What we'll go through is in the last five years, there has been a meteoric change in the management of melanoma because two groups of oncological therapy came through and previously there was nothing. So if you were diagnosed with metastatic melanoma, so it spread distantly, 
you typically had about three to six months to live and that's within the 2010s that that decade but what's happened now is we're at a stage where there's talk of people being cured with distant widespread metastases and melanoma which from being one of the most aggressive uh, malignancies now has changed the face of it so actually we have got reductions in mortality now again but it's still quite early days to establish what they are but <clears throat> What we do know is from US data that the mortality rate is decreasing there and that's really from just prior to these adjuvant oncological therapies. So the question is why? Now <clears throat> the US has been very good at putting together a database across the country called the SEER database which looks at a number of factors and they haven't got any evidence to say why it's reduced but their question is whether it's behavioural changes. So are younger people using sunbeds less? particularly in hot states in the US, have they been covering up more, putting sun cream on, et cetera, et cetera. So it's probably a behavioral change and it's really from aggressive public health campaigns. <clears throat> Etiology, again, UV light, same as non-melanoma skin cancers um, and particularly UVB um, and causing sunburn. What we do know is that it's often related to moles, so pigmented lesions which are benign and Here's a patient with a number of moles that have been six circled. Some have got more than one in the circle that are thought to be worrying. And we'll go on to what classifies them as that. But if you've got more than 50, then you're thought to be higher risk for melanoma. And there's different cutoffs. If you've got more than 100, higher risk again. Lots of moles, though, are entirely normal forms of, of lesions, which are non, they're, they're growths, but then they're not pre-malignant, they're not malignant, they're entirely normal. But then you can get some which are dysplastic. So that means that they've had a degree of change from the original cell type, but they're not a, a tumour or a malignancy rather. Um, and you get benign pigmented nevi, so benign moles. But then you get some which are called dysplastic. And if you get dysplastic ones, you're a bit worried that they're basically on a spectrum of looking at going from normal to dysplastic to pre-malignant to malignant. Um, but interestingly, even if you've got lots of moles, only about a third who develop melanoma arise in a lesion that was there before. So yes, it can go on to become a melanoma, but actually it's more a marker of someone of a skin type who is more prone to developing melanoma rather than they are a precancerous lesion that always becomes melanoma. And again, immunosuppression, <clears throat> that sort of dysregulation of the immune system seems to just allow these things to go unchecked and melanoma is more common in immunosuppressed people. So other things to ask in the history, past medical history, non-melanoma skin cancer, have you had that? Because of the accumulation of sun changes, then you are more likely to develop a melanoma. And once you've had one melanoma, you can well develop a second one. <clears throat> About 10% are related to in a, well, familial. So have you had someone in the family who's had melanoma, died of melanoma, an important element of the history because it's not necessarily a specific gene mutation but it's an accumulation of your genetic type <clears throat> and genetic sequencing that you are more likely to develop melanoma if someone in the family's had it. What's quite common is and you can see in the picture here elderly people often have pigment, cha pigment changes and it's classically on the face and on the cheek and it's really a pre-malignant lesion, but they can develop melanoma within it. But you often see that running in families. So that's just something to be aware of. Clinical assessment. <clears throat> just before starting, it's really important to highlight in a skin cancer service, it's an MDT. You have lots of people involved. And for the patient who's presenting, their first port of call is usually the GP. They've had a mold that's changed <clears throat> and the GP is a bit worried about it. So they always get referred for a two week wait consultation seen within two weeks by usually a dermatologist. The dermatologist may then see them and think it needs a biopsy. So it needs to be removed for a diagnosis. If it's on a nose or eyelid, it may go to a plastic surgeon, somewhere simpler, they may do it. And then we need a pathologist to look at the specimen. They'll then get a result and they'll either come to us or dermatology and a skin cancer nurse specialist will also be there <clears throat> because it's important for patient support and ongoing cancer contact, and that's in any form of cancer. And they're really their port of call into well-being, mental health issues, 
support from the results and future plans and coordinating appointments. If they need some staging to see if there's any spread, then a radiologist. Further treatment, maybe plastic surgeon or an oncologist. And then for ongoing surveillance, you may need all of the above people. So you can see that's the sort of typical patient journey and there's lots of people involved. So what's the, the way to assess it? Many of you will have heard of this, A, B, C, D, E. Sometimes E is missed off, but as you see, top of it, asymmetry. If it's well circumscribed, symmetrical, less likely to be malignant. If it's asymmetrical, then there's more likely to be an issue. An irregular border, again, more likely to be malignant in terms of melanoma. If they've got two or more different colors within the lesion, then that's a worrying sign. And something which is growing and is bigger than six millimeters, that's typically used as a cutoff, you'd be worried about melanoma. That sort of rules out a lot of your normal moles that are symmetrical with a regular border, same color and small. Then things that are evolving, so it's getting bigger, the color's changed, it's become asymmetric, and then is there any bleeding or itching is a, a fairly crude indicator, but bleeding being the most worrying sign. So again, a bit like BCCs and SCCs, it makes things confusing as a student because there's more than one type. BCCs and SCCs can look the same, they can look wildly different. The commonest type is a flat lesion, which is superficial spreading melanoma, <clears throat> flush to the skin or fairly flush, different pigmentation, irregular border, um, asymmetric, and a diameter bigger than six millimeters. You're suspicious that of that. There's something about it that just looks a bit more aggressive. And that accounts for about 70%. The next commonest is nodular melanoma, um, and it's lump, it's raised. That just doesn't look quite right. Interestingly, one of the important differentials for a nodular melanoma is a pigmented BCC. So we didn't see any pictures of that, but it just highlights how different these things can look. A BCC can have pigmentation as well, and it looks like a melanoma, as can other moles. So it's confusing, but really what you want to know when you get something like this, you need a pathological diagnosis to say what it is. There are other types. Again, that picture of the lesion on the cheek, flat lesions, they're typically on the face, lentigo maligna, melanoma. So lentigo maligna is pre-malignant. If, if you biopsy it and it's got invasive melanoma, you add melanoma to the end of the title. Subungual melanoma, that means it's under the nail and coming from there. That's the type you see in people of dark skin tone. So that's, that's the particularly important one in skin cancer for people with dark skin tones. I've had some pigment change under the nail, um, which is common in, in Caucasian people, rarely ever skin cancer, um, but occasionally melanoma, but it's the one you worry about in darker skin tones um, and is what Bob Marley died of, subungual melanoma. Want to confuse the picture again, amelanotic melanoma seems completely um, converse to what you'd expect, but it doesn't have pigmentation in like the bottom right. <coughs> and then one that can look a bit like an SCC, not really sure what it is, desmoplastic melanoma, about one or two percent, that's it at the very bottom left. It tends to be, have been there for quite a while and not behave quite like a melanoma. It looks like a scaling, crusty lesion, like an SCC or BCC, but actually it's a melanoma. So what do you do? You, someone comes in, they say they've got this lesion that doesn't seem quite right, so they think it's a mole that's changed. Well, you're going to take the history, as we did previously, of any sunburn, sun exposure, how's it changed, and then you're going to go on to the examination and, and just looking at it with the naked eye, A, B, C, D, E. Then there's further assessment that you want to do you want to have a look with a dermatoscope. So dermoscopy is this magnified image you can see at the bottom. And it's mainly used by dermatologists, but increasingly by plastic surgeons. And it just gives you some more information on a microscopic level. So you can see there's two blue arrows there, and they point to an area that you can convince yourself looks gray. Blue gray is what we tend to call it. Now, interestingly, that's the reflection of light from the dermis. So that means what you're looking at there is actually in the dermis. Now, what we know is that when a tumor goes from epidermis into dermis, it's invasive. So that bit we're looking at is an indicator of something that's invaded into the dermis, is an invasive tumor. What we're suspecting is a melanoma here. You can also look at the other things of variable pigmentation. This one isn't the best one, but if you look at the edges, if you think of, sort of 
a network, and by that I mean a crisscross pattern. A normal mole tends to have that. You sort of lost that crisscross pattern here, but you might convince yourself you can see a honeycombing at the edges. It's not clear on this, but if it was normal, you'd expect it to look more like a honeycomb. The other parts of this are full skin check, any other lesions apart from the one the patient identified that are of concern, and feel for the lymph nodes. <clears throat> so management, what we want to know really is what is it? We can have our best possible guess with clinical assessment, dermoscopy, but we want to know what it is under pathology. So you're going to the gold standard for melanoma is to excise the whole thing with a small margin, one to two millimeters of normal skin, and send it off to the pathologist. So you'd excise it as they've shown here, maybe a little bit wider, that's quite narrow, but around it of normal skin. But what you really want to know, is it a melanoma? And if it is, how thick is it? Because the thickness, so from the skin surface going deep, determines the prognosis. How aggressive is this tumour going to be in terms of spread? And that is the Breslow thickness, Breslow being the person who described it. So the gold standard is an excision biopsy where you take the whole thing. <clears throat> the one caveat, you'd say never do it, take part of the lesion, always take all of it. The one caveat is if you've got a lesion which covers a large portion of the cheek, like those old patients with lentigo malignant melanoma, to remove all of that and then find out it's pre-malignant is quite a lot to do. So you may well take the bit you're concerned about, which is the darkest pigmentation. <clears throat> the upside is if it's not malignant, then you know that bit's not, not cancerous. The downside is you haven't represented the whole lesion, so what are you going to do? The, the one thing you want to know is that you've captured the, the deepest and the thickest bit of it, so the deepest Breslow thickness, but doing a partial biopsy doesn't tell you that. So that's why in nearly every circumstance you want to take an excision biopsy to analyse the whole specimen, the whole lesion. <clears throat> and here you are, so there's other indicators of how aggressive it's going to be. The table on the right is your staging, so the AJCC staging for melanoma. And you can see there are two key determinants of the thickness, that's the Breslow thickness, and whether it's ulcerated. So has it got a wound within it? <coughs> I think the other things to say, you want other information from the pathologist. How thick? Is it ulcerated? What type is it? Is it the superficial spreading? They tend to be not quite as aggressive as other subtypes like the subungual so under the nail, that's much more aggressive than a superficial one. Um, and then there's other factors, mitotic rate, so mitosis, the amount of cellular activity, you can see mitotic figures under a microscope. Is it a vertical growth or horizontal growth phase? Well, vertical obviously going down, so it's more aggressive. Has it invaded lymphatics or vascular structures on a microscopic level, more aggressive? Perineural, gone around a nerve sheath, more aggressive. And then there's this strange phenomenon where a melanoma can regress slightly. And strangely, that's a feature of an aggressive melanoma because at one point it's been worse, but it's got slightly better, but it can go back to being worse again. That's the simplest way to look at it, really. Um, but there are other things to consider apart from the Breslow thickness and the ulceration. But Breslow thickness, the absolute most important, ulceration a bit less. And you can see in the thickness here that one millimetre is used as an initial cutoff. Um, we've now gone to 0.8 or 0.8 to 1, just to break it up slightly, but one millimetre or less is a thin melanoma, best prognosis, more than that, intermediate or thick, but the thinner it is, the better your prognosis. Five-year survival, this was before these new oncological treatments were available. If you're, you had a tumour which was less than one millimetre, at five years, 95% or more patients were survive, would survive and be alive. If you look to the thickest, so if they had a four millimeter or more thickness tumor, only a third to a half were alive. So you can see how important it is to have that, have that Breslow thickness and for it to be accurate. It was prior to the adjuvant therapy, so that's these new oncological treatments for metastatic disease. Um, <clears throat> but it still gives a good indication. So what do we do? You've done a biopsy, it says it's melanoma. What happens now? Well, what we tend to do is take a bigger margin around it 
because there may be some cells that you can't see under the microscope that are still there. That's the rationale. So you take more to reduce the chance of it coming back at that point. So if you've taken it off the back, you take a wider margin to reduce the chance of melanoma coming back on the back. It doesn't actually influence the chance of it coming back in the lymph nodes or distant organs. Um, but if it's less than a millimeter thick, we take a centimeter margin around the scar. So it's gonna be a much bigger scar. Or if it's greater than one millimeter, you take two centimeters. The slight caveat to that is if it's on the eyelid, you're probably going to be more conservative. So you have to just think, am I going to take two centimeters around the eyelid and take the whole thing off to not improve overall survival, just reduce the chance of it coming back on the eyelid. You're going to adjust what you do, but that's unusual. Um, the other thing to think about is something called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So a sentinel lymph node, which you may all know about already, but is the, the first draining lymph node of that patch of skin. What patients will have, and I'm going to show you a quick video, is a nuclear medicine scan on the same day or the day before to see where that patch of skin drains to. So you do an injection in the skin and see where that goes to. If it's on the cheek, it'll go to the neck. If it's on the leg, it'll go to the groin. If it's on the arm, it'll go to the axilla. If it's on the trunk, it could go to an axilla, could go to the groin, could go to both. It could go to both axilla and groin. Um, but a central node biopsy does a nuclear medicine scan to map out where it drains to, and then an operation to harvest that lymph node to see if it's got any disease in. And we tend to do that for the group which are T1B or thicker. So anyone with a tumor which is 0.8 millimeters or above, or one which is ulcerated of any, of any type of thickness. Um, and if the patient has a lymph node which is, you can feel, then we just remove all the lymph nodes. You don't need to do a biopsy. Let me just come out of this presentation. I'll try and play this picture and hopefully you can see it. A lymph node, the presence of the blue dye and an instrument Let me that just come back to So, so, so what happens is they had a biopsy, which is the scar. And you inject radioactive substance in nuclear medicine and it just spreads through these lymphatics which you can see depicted here on the skin surface. You can then do two options. You use a gamma camera to identify the hot spot on the body and that'll probably go to the axilla here but it could go to the upper neck or it could go to the groin but almost certainly the axilla. It's next to the axilla. The other option is to get a more complex picture and let me just pause that for a second using a CT scan. So you get the hot spot, a bit like um, what we talked about earlier about PET-CT, we get a hot spot on the anatomical image. What ha then happens, you've got the depiction from the scan of the sensor node, where does it go to? Does it go to the groin or the axilla here? You know it goes um, to the Dunn. axilla, Sorry, it can Mr. be Dunn. more um, than one. Um, I think the video is not, not playing or it's not at the correct slide. Sorry, did you lose me there? Uh, no, I said currently I'm seeing a blank screen. Um, yeah, the screen's completely just, just white. Um, we can't see anything playing okay. actually. Okay, no worries. Sorry about that. I'm not quite sure. But you, you might need to um, share screen like, uh, you need to share screen again to the, to the video that you're playing. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Let me try again. It's, it's quite a good video. Uh, I think it's a new share, isn't it? There we go. Hopefully this works now. Yep, Can you see? Sorry about yep. that, everyone. Um, so let's just go back through it. Because I think, I think it's important. It can be difficult to imagine what's happening, but... To help view the sentinel. Can you still hear me talk? Yep, we can hear you. You can. Like the radioactive material. The dye also drains by lymphatic channels to the sentinel node. A small incision is made near the sentinel lymph node. 
the presence of the blue dye and an instrument that detects radiation allowed the surgeon to identify the central node. This is the second the part node of is surgery. removed and sent to a pathologist who slices it into multiple pieces. Each slice is examined under a microscope for melanoma cells. Special stains also are used to help visualize even a tiny number of cancer cells. If melanoma has spread to the sentinel lymph node, the other nodes in this area are surgically removed to be certain they do not contain addition. So let me just come out of there and reshare. So that looked like it was one part of the same procedure. Um, but actually it's 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 two so the the bit they did initially with the injection of the radioactive material that's done in nuclear medicine same day or maybe even the day before and it just maps where that drains to so you know that that the the scar drained to the axilla so that gives you that information it may tell you there's two central nodes as well which is important the next day, general anaesthetic procedure, you inject blue dye before surgery because then you've got two things. The blue dye will track along the lymphatics and the lymph node should look blue, the first one it drains to. And you've also got a probe which detects radiation. Um, so two ways of identifying the central node, but you then make an incision, access the lymph nodes in the axilla and send them off to pathology. That takes about three weeks because it's quite time intensive. Um, to do that and you then get a result have you got disease which is in the first draining lymph node um, and that's microscopic because you couldn't feel it so it's not macroscopic but that is the most important prognostic indicator of causing a problem so is this melanoma going to be aggressive or not if you've got cells in the first draining lymph node then it's going to be a problem now there are two big trials that I think it's worth knowing. You don't know, need to know lots of, of studies, but there were MSLT1 and MSLT2, multi-center selective lymphadenectomy trial. What this did was look at people who had sentinel node biopsy for their melanoma or observation. Now, what it found was that sentinel node biopsy was much better at predicting who was going to have a problem. So instead of just looking at the tumor itself, doing this additional procedure was the most accurate way of seeing who was going to go on and have a problem with their melanoma. So if it was negative, you almost went one way and that you were much more likely to survive to five years. If it was positive, you were much more likely to have aggressive disease that became palpable in the, in the, in the lymph nodes and spread elsewhere. Now, what, could it improve survival by taking this lymph node and therefore removing the disease? Well, it was a bit unclear. There was an argument that it could, but to be honest, the disease has already spread from the site of the tumor along the lymphatic chain to a lymph node, and it's probably already gone. But our standard of practice at that point was that if you have a positive lymph node, and that was 20% of people would have a positive sensor node, you would then clear all the lymph nodes to try and get rid of any remaining disease. Now, about 20% of those people had more disease. So that was our standard of care, but we didn't really know if it improved survival. You could argue it either way. So that led on to the second trial, the MSLT2. And what it did was if you had a positive sensor node, what happened if you cleared the lymph nodes or left them? And actually what it showed was that clearing the lymph nodes did not improve your survival. And almost overnight, the practice worldwide stopped from doing these big operations, which caused quite a bit of morbidity with lymphedema, wound problems, nerve injuries, and practice pretty much stopped overnight to say, well, there's no improvement in survival, so there's no point in the patients having these big operations. So probably not what the trial investigators were thinking or what they hoped would come out of it, but it changed practice dramatically. To go on, the next step in these patients, if they have a positive sentinel node, or maybe even a very aggressive tumor, which is ulcerated thick, is to do surveillance and some a staging procedure, sorry. So sentinel node is very good at staging you to see if it's spread, but you need to do imaging. Um, and the scan on the top is a, a CT scan. The one underneath is the PET CT scan. So 
as you can see on the top one, there's an arrow just on the left of it. That's pointing towards a metastasis in the axilla. Um, but it's very difficult to see. The bottom one with the PET element shows you a hot spot of high activity and you can see how clear that is. So a PET CT has become our gold standard imperial. Um, and what you want to know is, has it spread, that stage three disease really, has it spread to the lymph nodes? So a positive sentinel node means it has. If you have some little bits of spread around the tumor satellite, that's stage three. Have you got a palpable lymph node? That's stage three. Um, but that's what this depicts. Spread to the lymph nodes is stage three disease and, and is metastatic. Um, and really you need to do imaging for surveillance as well. That's the other thing to do it for. So MSLT2 stopped these lymph node clearances overnight because there was no survival benefit. And by pure coincidence was when these two groups of oncological therapy came along at the same time. Also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first group with a targeted therapy. So when we talked about biomarkers before, about 50% of patients with melanoma have a mutation in the BRAF gene. Um, and targeted therapy is for those with this mutation of BRAF. And what it does, it's a, the BRAF mutation is in a, a chain and it would essentially block that chain of events from happening so that the tumour couldn't keep developing, progressing and spreading elsewhere. Um, now, by doing that, as with any chain of events in nature, evolution tends to be that it works a way around it. But it's very effective. And the key thing from this paper was that it showed that you could improve survival by taking these drugs, whereas clearing the lymph nodes couldn't. So we then went to these medications. Now, there's quite a few side effects, quite a lot of multi-system toxicity, probably not as severe as usual chemotherapy, um, but there's quite a lot of toxicity still, but it saves some lives. <clears throat> the second group that came along is the more exciting one, is now used throughout a number of malignancies, is immunotherapy. And it's a bit like the topical creams we talked about in the first lecture, that what they do is stimulate an immune response. And that's what immunotherapy does. Stimulates an immune response and is now really our go-to to treat metastatic melanoma, either when it's spread to the lymph nodes and a positive sensor node, or for patients who have had spread to other organs, so stage four metastatic disease, this is where it's had a huge survival benefit. So we call those two groups adjuvant therapy. Um, and what that shows is, and there's those two groups, stage three, where it spreads to lymph nodes, a modest improvement, stage four, improvement in overall survival has been much more marked. And for a disease that if it had spread to other organs, killed you in three to six months, only a few years ago, we're now talking about these patients being completely cured. Other things we can do, well, if it's spread within a limb, you can cut it out. You can do something called electrochemotherapy, where essentially you inject a bit of a chemotherapy agent called bleomycin, and you then cause, then put essentially a probe in, um, which gives an electrical current. So in those pores where the electrical current is, it then supplies the chemotherapy. Um, isolated limb infusional perfusion. This case at the bottom, you basically infuse chemotherapy agents into the artery and the vein and create a bypass circuit like cardiac surgery and it basically kills the cells. It can be quite toxic, can cause other problems but it's effective. Um, TVEC is a new treatment to viral vector supplying chemotherapy and then systemic things well chemotherapy not so effective, palliative radiotherapy it's really just to control problematic wounds. What do we do going forward? Well if you've got a thin melanoma you just do surveillance for one year. For everything else, we see them three monthly for three years, looking at the scar, looking at the lymph nodes, full skin check, and then six monthly for five years. As, a, as it was before, if they develop a lump in a, lump in a lymph node basin, you do a fine needle aspiration. Um, and lymph node clearance is pretty much stopped unless they develop a palpable lymph node. So just a quick case example, just to finish, what do you do? Well, this patient comes to you, you think it might be melanoma, but you take a history, you examine them, it's asymmetric, there's an irregular border, two colors at least within it. The diameter um, is bigger than six millimeters. You have a look with magnification and you can see that bluish gray appearance, so you know it's into the dermis. Lymph nodes are clear, you do a full skin check, there's nothing else. So you want to do it, get some pathology and do an excision biopsy. Um, 
Um, what do you do then? Well, you've got to wait for the results. The tumour comes back, Breslow thickness being the key determinant is 1.8 millimetres, so it's the thinnest being less than one. This is in that intermediate group where there's a risk of nodal spread. It's not ulcerated, but for these tumours, anything above 0.8, we offer a sentinel node biopsy. You can't feel any lymph nodes. That's important to determine because if you can feel a lymph node, then you need to work out if the tumour's already spread and progressed, but you can't feel anything. So what you do is you offer a wide excision of the scar to reduce local recurrence at the tumour site and a sentinel node biopsy. That's what, the, that's what the sentinel node will look like because of the blue dye. You can see the lump itself is the lymph node and there's a little line going to the right. That's a lymphatic chain. That's a lymphatic vessel feeding it. <clears throat> so what happens then? The wide excision, 99 times out of 100, comes back a scar only. Um, but we do always send it off. A couple of people have argued in the past why bother, but we always send it off and the patients like knowing there's no tumour there. The central node comes back as positive, so there is disease within it. Now, five years ago, that means they'd have had a lymph node clearance. We don't do that now. So because it's positive, we want to know, has the melanoma spread to other organs beyond the lymph nodes? So we would do in this hospital, a PET CT scan, which looks at the whole body with a CT scan and sees of any hotspots. For the brain, and melanoma does metastasize to the brain, an MRI scan is, is the best to do. It's much more sensitive than a CT scan. So we do both. Shows no distant metastases. So we've got a problem which is localized to the lymph nodes. So the next port of call is the oncologist. So the oncologist will offer one of those two groups of immunotherapy. And they stay with the oncologist really at this point. They need to have that and it's typically a 12 month course. It's very expensive, it's about 80 to 100,000 pounds a year for the drugs. Um, and what we're gonna do then is offer surveillance. Now we want to su su have surveillance while they're on the oncological treatment to see if anything progresses or if anything that has been seen improves. And that's usually with PET CT. So surveillance isn't just to see if anything comes back, it's also to see if any treatment's effective and what the changes. So in summary, melanoma is the most aggressive form of skin cancer. And that's really when we're talking about novel treatments, biomarkers, it's received most of the attention. It's an aggressive cancer, which in the past and still kills young people, but management has changed. Management of melanoma five years ago was surgical. If you had metastatic disease, in, in essence, you were palliative. But as with other branches, but none more so than melanoma, onco oncology has dramatically, dramatically changed that. And we now have two treatments available, which can not only prolong life, but there's certainly a suggestion it can cure widespread metastases. And it's now a possibility, and many would say we already have it, because patients who had disease in other organs have no evidence of disease three years. And that's the, the, the most length of the data that we have, but no disease at three years following treatment with immunotherapy. So it, it has been a remarkable turnaround um, and hopefully something that's going to continue to improve. So thank you again. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to field any more questions. Okay, thank you very much to Mr. Dunn for the two lectures. So if there are any questions for this lecture or the one before, feel free to type them in the chat box. Or if you want to unmute yourself, that's fine as well. And in the meantime, before you leave, we would greatly appreciate you filling out the two feedback forms. So for both lectures, for the first one. Uh, on I've, I've just made them as like one, um, one uh, feedback just form, one actually. feedback form, all right. Yeah, one feedback form. And please do. I'd love to see what the comments are. It'd be nice to change things yes. as well. See how it's pitched to be very helpful. If you we'll, we'll share it with you. I'll, uh, I'll send you. Um, Thanks, Claire. I'll send you a link. No worries. <clears throat> oh, so that's Is one question. Lymphadenopathy for a positive sentinel lymph node still done for other cancers? Say again. Is sentinel lymph node biopsy done for other cancers? Is that? Uh, yeah, I think so. They said lymphadenopathy, but I mean, they probably mean like lymph node clearance. Is that what you mean? 
from uh, for central yes. just, lymph node clearance yeah for Cent positive central lymph node done for other cancers yes central lymph node biopsy has very much been for melanoma um slightly controversial in the other areas it's used um just to touch on that first because it sort of impacts so it's used in breast surgery a bit and a positive central node gets you an auxiliary clearance although there's some evidence that other treatments such as radiotherapy can be as effective but it is so breast surgery yes central lymph node biopsy is an option but they sometimes also do an auxiliary sampling where you take three or four nodes and that's fairly similar to central lymph node biopsy and how accurate it is if you have a central lymph node which is positive you have an auxiliary clearance yes um, <clears throat> other options the other use of central node particularly in our field is you can do it for oropharyngeal head and neck SCCs that's mucosal SCCs but in general head and neck surgeons have done elective lymph node dissections that means if you have an aggressive tumor you feel if you don't have any lymph nodes to feel or show up on CT they still clear the lymph nodes because the risk of spread is greater than 20 percent is their rationale <clears throat> and essentially before central lymph node biopsy that's what we used to do in melanoma you just used to clear the lymph nodes but again without any evidence of increased survival so breast they do clear the lymph nodes head and neck central nodes not used that much but if you had a positive they would clear it um but they both have high risk of having recurrent disease whereas for us now we know that it doesn't improve survival and it's quite morbid interestingly the neck dissection is the one you think was the worst the groin is the worst because of wound healing problems and lymphoma lymphedema axilla next and then neck dissection despite the complexity of the anatomy tends to have the least problematic outcomes so yes clearance can be used elsewhere but it's more related to how aggressive the recurrence is and what the side effects of the clearance are um, but breast still uses it although there's some move towards moving away from it but they haven't got there yet <clears throat>